Welcome again, everyone. And thank you for joining us for this APF at Home Fireside Chat. We are thrilled to welcome Dr. Phil Kendall today. Dr. Kendall is a recipient of the newly redesigned APF Gold Medal for Impact and Psychology Award. I am your host today. My name is Gail Beck. I'm a member of the American Psychological Foundation Board of Trustees, and I have the incredible honor of chatting with Bill by the fire, the virtual fire today. As you surely know, APF is the premier private grant-making foundation in psychology. APF provides over $1 million annually in grant awards with increases coming every year thanks to your generosity. Our goal is to support psychologists and students who are using psychology to address major issues and improve lives. APF is somewhat unique in that it receives the overwhelming majority of its funding, around 95%, from individuals like you, people who are joining us today who support our mission. We cannot, as a group, begin to express our gratefulness enough to you for your generous investment in APF and the important research that we're able to continue to fund. As we start into this conversation, I'm gonna ask that if you have any questions for Dr. Kendall, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A feature, uh, which is found at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will do our best to address all the questions at the end of this program. Um, if there's something that is timely that comes up in the Q&A, we'll certainly um, include that as we go. Um, it's now my immense pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Philip Kendall, who I'm gonna call Phil, because I have known Phil for quite a while. Um, Phil is currently Distinguished University Professor and the Laura H. Carnell Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at Temple University. His curriculum beta is like a small phone book, maybe a medium-sized phone book, and it includes over 25 books, treatment manuals, and workbooks with over 800 scholarly publications, most of which are in the field's leading journals. Um, his citation count is ridiculous and makes all of the rest of us feel fairly inadequate, to be honest. Um, the citation for Phil's award reads as follows. In recognition for his groundbreaking work with anxiety in youth, Philip C. Kendall has had a meaningful impact in the creation of tools and materials to assess and treat anxiety in children and youth. These materials have been translated into over a dozen languages and are used as the standard of treatment across the globe. Dr. Kendall has demonstrated a seamless integration of research and treatment to the point of expanding clinical research methodology as he adapted treatments to improve outcomes. Warm welcome to you today, Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this may sound like a platitude. It isn't. I want to thank APF. I mean, a round of applause to APF for being in existence and for funding things. And I've, I've had a student funded by APF. Um, and it's a, it's a great honor to be, uh, to be given this award. So I, I just want to thank APF for starters. And, you know, I also have to thank my mom and dad. You know, mom said, be a lawyer or be a teacher. So at first she was disappointed in me, but in the end it came through. And, and my dad was very persistent. You know, he was a person who would do a good job and if you're gonna do it, do it well. And so I wanna thank him for that sort of message that he communicated in, in his day-to-day -day work. Thank my spouse. Um, just wanna show you this. She, uh, she got this for me when the award was uh, arranged. It's a little Oscar. Uh, PCK is a BDF. Anyway. Um, <laughs> I want to thank the students. I had a ton of students to work with, and they're so darn smart. Um, thank the universities, NIMH, a lot of people to thank. And I, I just didn't want to not mention that because that's an important part of what 
what goes on is people support you and you have to be respectful of that because it's a big deal for them as well. So thanks to everybody. Bill, you are not only smart and have had a huge impact, but clearly you're really gracious. And oh, I, know I have always appreciated that about you. Um, let's move into talking a little bit about your work, if that's okay. Sure. Um, a major component of your scholarly work focuses on the development, refinement, and application of a treatment program for kids called Coping Cat. Um, Coping Cat is kind of unique because it recognizes that children are not just like little miniature adults, that you know they have somewhat different needs um, and competencies. Can you speak a bit about how you pursued the development of Coping Cat in a way that recognized the unique socio-emotional and cognitive competencies of children? I'm happy to, happy to. Um, I want to start by saying that I'm a dog person, and I really <laughs> would have preferred the title have a dog name in it. <laughs> um, but as we were working, we said kids come in as, quote, a scaredy cat or a fraidy cat, and we wanted them to leave as a coping cat. And so the, the label just fit, and I had to put aside my preference for Labrador retrievers and German shepherds and, and other dogs and just go with the cat name. So, so coping cat was meant to be that you don't get rid of anxiety, that you learn to manage it, you cope with it. Um, and, and kids, are not known for their want to sit and talk with a grown up. <laughs> that's that's not on their top 10 list. Um, but what do kids learn from? How do kids learn? Well, just look at school. They, they have homework, they have workbooks, um, they get rewards, they have practice. You know, if they're gonna learn a musical instrument, they carry it around, they practice, you know, and they keep track of the practice and then they perform a little recital. And so it was very, I'm going to say simple or obvious uh, to me that if you're going to work with kids, having them sit in an office where you pontificate your psychological theories or attempt to help them understand things, that's over their head. You know, they, they want to play games. So our approach to treatment for, for young kids was let's have a workbook, let's have rewards, let's have homework, and let's have practice. Uh, and that became sort of a central notion, as well as, you know, having taken courses in developmental psychology, um, some of which were, were quite helpful, you learn about what kids can and can't process cognitively. And, and their notion of metacognition, thinking about their own thinking, doesn't happen to a certain age, 10 or 12, let's say. And their ability to self-reflect or even recognize physiological symptoms doesn't happen to a certain age. So we were all about making it fit for kids. And um, I wasn't, you know, an anxiety disordered youth or anything, but I certainly felt anxiety as probably everyone did, you know, and, and there are times when you can relate to the experience and you could relate to it as a kid. You probably can't relate to relationship issues uh, when you're 12, um, but anxiety is something you could. Um, and so for me, uh, it was a matter of putting together materials that weren't highfalutin psychology but were informed by science and appropriate for the developmental level of the kids. Um, and for me, it was key that we were intervening before they had established habits. You know, if, if you were, I'll pick an age, 47, and you've been doing something for 30 years, it's tougher to change than if you're 17 or 12. And you've just started having some, let's call them irrational beliefs. And uh, it's easier to change when they're not so embedded in concrete. Um, so for me, it was like smart to work with youth rather than to wait till the problems get more severe. Um, and, and science played a big part for me. Um, I, I was of a mind that... Um, probably coming from a frugal family with little funds that you don't waste time and you don't waste money. And so I was of a mind that if a parent were to pay for services, they should get something they can see 
that has a result. Um, and so treatment wasn't just something as a, um, a way to work with kids. It was more a way to demonstrate to parents that there are some positive outcomes. Um, and, and that was that was largely shaped by my undergraduate education in learning theory. Um, and, and coping cat was kind of um, kind of fun. I mean, I, I literally really remember three graduate students and myself, one of whom had been a school teacher, sitting in a room, putting it together. And um, we did, I think we had four children. Our first four cases were four case studies. And then we did a outcome comparison and then a randomized clinical trial, I think three or four, and then one with 458 participants compared to medications, and then, you know, 12 year follow ups. Um, so over, gosh, I hate to say this, <laughs> but over 40 years, um, <laughs> it, it's gone from a couple of case studies to rather large and long term follow up randomized clinical trials. So it's been a it's been a career, really. Yeah. Yeah, it's been an impressive career in terms of your impact on how kids with anxiety are treated. Um, you had uh, you had mentioned the different languages. Uh, yeah. There's a coping bear, Canada. There's a uh, coping camel in the United Arab Emirates. Um, and if if I'm not mistaken, the attempt at a translation in Israel resulted in the coping rodent. <laughs> Um, but but basically, the idea is that um, there's an acronym that you can use that works in different languages. So it changes a little bit, but it's essentially the same ingredients. Yeah, yeah. And what is the youngest age that can be um, worked with, youngest age kids that can be worked with with coping cat? That, that's a really good question. Um, age is a proxy for cognitive development. So if you use age, you're kind of taking a blunt cut. I'd rather get more specific. I'd rather say when they reach the point when they're having some peer relations that are meaningful and some social evaluations that are meaningful, roughly seven, eight, roughly that grade level, roughly that age, sometimes girls a little sooner than boys, varies. Um, but right about then, um, prior to that, I think the intervention strategy of choice, which is someone else's work more than mine, is working with the parents, you know, helping the parents be proud of their kids being brave, helping the parents not model anxious behavior, helping the parents not accommodate avoidance. Um, so if they're, you know, four or five or six, I'd probably just work with the parents. Yeah, that makes sense, especially because the pink cat sort of follows the the routine that kids are used to in, once they're in school. Yeah. 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 And I love your story about how, you know, it was you and three graduate students sitting around a conference table because those of us in academia know those days and know how incredibly rich those kinds of conversations can be and how, in your case, incredibly productive um, and helpful those conversations can be. So, Clearly, this was not this work was not something that other people were doing at the point in time. And it sort of started with the like, how do we produce materials? How do we address anxiety in kids who are school aged on up? Um, and you were fairly early in your career when you first started this work. And I would sort of see this as my label would be high risk research. So this is work that very few other people are doing. Um, and work that easily could have been disparaged by more senior scientists in the field, um, which is sort of a challenging place as a, as a young scientist. Um, when you look back at that, what advice can you offer students and early career scientists who are also working in areas that are not terribly mainstream? Um, I guess high risk does kind of fit when I think about it. Um, I do dance to my own drummer. Um, I can recall at a time when I was on faculty at the University of Minnesota 
and I had published a paper on the readability index of textbooks in psychology. I was teaching an uh, undergraduate intro class, and they were giving me free copies of all the books, hoping they'd be adopted. I had about 20 books. And I said, you know, which is the right one for this class? And I found this um, readability index, which allowed you to, de to determine whether it was, you know, a high level book or a simplistic book and whether it had a science feel or not, and that kind of thing. And so I analyzed these different books and then published a paper on the readability of psychology textbooks. And one of the senior faculty said, what'd you do that for? And I said, it was fun. <laughs> it was adding information that I wanted to know to pick a textbook and making it public so others could use it without having to do the work. Um, but I think you're right. There was a little, a little outsider sense to it. Like, what are you doing that for? That's not the current zeitgeist, if you will. Um, but it is a little bit, I'm a different drummer and I, I kind of just do what I think is right. And it was fun. And that, that kind of sparked me. E even, I mean, I did some studies with the MMPI based largely on a instructor I had at, at graduate school. And when I was doing the MMPI studies, I had to keep track of, you know, how many items there are, whether it was a true or false answer and how you correct for whether someone had a actual physical disability, like in a wheelchair, as opposed to a conversion disorder, faking a physical illness. Um, and so I wanted to correct the interpretation of the MMPI. And I remember watching a basketball game. If you're interested, it was when Notre Dame beat UCLA and cut their streak and stopped it. Um, but I remember watching the game and I had the MMPIs in front of me and I was counting and I had to put it down because the game got so exciting. I couldn't concentrate on my, um, but typically I would, you know, do some of the work while there was something on, on the TV in the background or whatever, because it was fun. I was interested, wanted to answer the question and it was fun. So it wasn't like somebody told me to do it. It was work I wanted to do because it was of interest and I thought important. Um, yeah, so I'm hearing, it's funny, most people march to their own drummers, but you dance, and I think that's so <laughs> about you. Um, so I'm hearing that some of the motivation was, this is interesting, this is fun, I enjoy this, but you just told us that like a senior colleague at Minnesota, which can be a kind of daunting place, basically said, why are you doing that, right? Um, I'm assuming you were like an untenured assistant professor kind of person at that point. What advice do you have for folks who are earlier on in their career than you and I, who get that kind of input, which easily can kind of put you back on your heels, can say, oh, I should be doing more mainstream things like everybody else is doing, but my passion doesn't lie there. Um. You may have just answered the question. Um, I would tell somebody, follow their passion. Um, I'm not saying this is correct, but I do recall it being in my mind at the time. I discounted the senior colleagues' input. I said, they just don't know. Um, it was clear to me at the time that in order to get promoted and tenured, publications were important. I had already accumulated a stack of those, so it wasn't like this was replacing something else or getting in the way. I wasn't flipping burgers or doing a car wash. This was still good science. So I remember dismissing the senior colleagues input. Um, not that that's always wise, it isn't. But it did seem to me that that person um, wasn't saying anything helpful. So I dismissed it. Um, I, and I would encourage people um, to follow their passion. There used to be a phrase about um, good researchers have a wild hair or a burn in their belly or all these other silly nonsense phrases. I think it's really about passion and, and you want to do something that's potentially helpful and you want to do it with science and so you work hard at it. Um, and you know, um, popularity is not the goal for me because um, once you become popular, a lot of people don't like you anymore. You know, 
popular music is popular for most people, but a lot of people like alternative music. <laughs> um, and, and so once you get 51% of the people on one side, the other 49% are likely to say, well, I don't like the popular stuff. So it was never in my mind that I had to do something that would be accepted by everybody. That was kind of like unachievable and, and irrational. So I, I kind of dismissed that early on. So you've been a renegade from early on is what I'm hearing. And you probably never thought of yourself that way, but you've said, you know, this is important. I want this work to be, to have an impact, to be practical, to impact the lives of families that have a kid who's struggling with anxiety and, you know, senior colleagues are going to say one thing or another. And then rather than just taking that and going, oh, I should study reaction time in the lab, you say, well, let me think about that, right? You know, what do I need to ensure job stability, e.g. to get tenured, right? I need X, Y, Z. Do I have X, Y, Z? Yes. So what difference does it make if I'm also doing yeah. this other little thing on the side? Yeah. You know, that, I would say that's, that's accurate. And Although it's accurate and I, I feel good about wanting to help, that was a, a big issue. There was also the sense of job security. And there was also the sense of if you do something, you should do it well, which for me meant be active and be contributing and be an active participant in the field, um, as opposed to, you know, somewhat passive. Yeah, so your father's influence was pretty yeah. important in that, yeah. When he would rake the leaves, there'd be no leaves on the lawn. <laughs> well, Phil, I think you have mastered not leaving leaves on the lawn when I look at your career. It's it's been pretty remarkable. You know, when you when you started with acknowledging and thanking people um, who have contributed to your impact, you mentioned right off the bat. Um, some of the students that you've worked with. And when I look at the list of people that you have trained and mentored, you've mentored and trained some extraordinary students who some of them started as undergraduates with you. Some of them were graduate students. Some of them were postdoctoral fellows. Um, you sort of had this incredible broadband of training impact. Um, it's clear that mentoring and education is something that's really important for you. Um, and you've won numerous awards for um, your incredible service as an educator and a mentor. Um, as you've grown in your career, how has your success shaped the way that you work with trainees? And how has it changed your conceptualization and thinking about working with students and postdocs? So um, I don't think it's changed that much. I think it's been shaped by some early experiences I had. When I was an undergraduate, I was fortunate to work with someone who had just gotten their PhD from Rutgers, took their first job. This was at Old Dominion University. And I was a psychology major, and I was able to get connected with this faculty member, Peter McCulka. And he was a brand new PhD and he was doing research. I wanted to do research. So I had the luxury of being an undergraduate in a department that didn't have PhD students. So I could operate with a new PhD and get mentored. So I, I learned about science. I learned about even building the equipment to do rat research. We did studies of condition safety, Pavlovian condition safety, which is early in anxiety work. Um, but the key thing there for me was, it was classroom. It was after the classroom in the lab. And he would have people out to his house. So there'd be a summer event or there'd be a holiday party. And it was very much like a small university would be. At the same time, very much like an R01 university would be. Uh, and I remember thinking, that's, that's a good system. And so in my current environment, and it's been the same for now for about 40 years. We have day of fun. Uh, I think your mentoring experience included going skiing for one day, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> uh, 
ours, we go to the shore, the Jersey Shore. It's a Tuesday, which is usually our very busiest day in the week. We go down on Monday. We spend Monday night. We spend Tuesday at the shore. We cook. We play games. Um, that's an important part of mentoring. Um, Al Finch was a mentor in graduate school, and Al Finch was the same way. Um, we would meet about research. We would meet about clinical issues. We would talk about science and grants, and yet we were on the same basketball team, and, and we would play, you know, in the I think at the time it was called a fraternity league or an intramural league at VCU. And I think that not separating a therapist from the patient or a client, not separating the instructor from the trainee, but that you're people and you're working together, collaborating. Uh, I think that's a thread that's been around that I was exposed to that I've copied. Um, even Don Kiesler, who wasn't my primary advisor in graduate school, uh, he was similarly um, collaborative. You know, it was conversations in the hallway. It was um, drinks at a bar. <laughs> it was events that we went to together where he would say things that would be very influential. Um, and, and I think paying it forward is the maybe modern day phrase. Um, but that's how I kind of look at it. Um, and there was a time, and it still exists on my desktop at the university, where I have a list of undergraduates who've worked in our studies who have gone on to get PhDs, and a list of PhDs who've gone on to get university or other impactful jobs, and postdocs and where they are. And it's kind of fun to see. And um, I was at ABCT in New York just ooh, a couple of weeks ago, and there was a little gathering, and I met someone, and they introduced themselves. And they were my academic grandchildren. Uh, I didn't know them, you know, but they were students of Brian Chu, who was a student of mine, that kind of thing. And it was fun. It was great fun. Um, I guess I find a lot of pleasure in that. Uh, and to be honest, in a selfish way, you learn a ton if you listen. So I'm doing work on treating anxious kids. And I'll just pick names out of a hat here. Jenny Hudson comes along and she's interested in family. So we start studying family. Munia Khanna comes along. She's an expert on computer stuff. John Comer comes along and we start doing computer applications. Coping Cat on computer, Camp Coppola. Um, Renad Betis comes along. She's interested in dissemination. We start studying how can you apply this in schools? And we got schools in Canada, suburban Philadelphia, and did a large study evaluating that. Um, Connor Kern, formerly Connor Puleo, she was interested in autism spectrum disorder. I wasn't really, but I said, well, you know, those kids get anxiety. So we did a couple of large studies with ASD youth who also have anxiety. And the treatment differs a little. You need to be more involved with parents, longer sessions, more contingent rewards, less conceptual. But you can get some results, not on the ASD, but on the anxiety. And that's counter current. Um, Leslie Norris is interested in moderators of treatment outcome. We've been studying that for five years. So for me, mentoring is important to be the giver, but selfishly, you're also the receiver. If you, if you have your ears open and somebody comes in with a passion, my question is usually, how does that relate to anxiety? And how can we do something about that? Uh, and so, you know, I, there are current students now interested in peers. When these kids get treatment, what are the benefits if they share it with their peers? So we're doing a study evaluating, uh, let's call it peer sharing, and similar kinds of things like that. So mentoring for me is a two-way street. I kind of like it. Um, I kind of feel rewarded by it. Maybe take too much pleasure in the accomplishments of others. Um, but it's also beneficial for me to, to have my ears open, uh, learn what their passion is and help shape what I think is the quality work on the topic. Um, that, that list of former students is kind of fun. Well, and I'm hearing that, you know, you're, you're not locked into students doing your work as it were. Right, you, right. You are, open and want to support students as they develop their own 
kind of trajectory of interest. So you use the example of um, kind of the co-occurrence of autism spectrum disorder and anxiety. Um, and I remember you doing that work and I thought, oh, look at that. Phil's developed a sudden interest in autism spectrum disorder. And now I understand that that was in support of a student who was super interested in that. Um, how do you, when the student finishes and goes on to whatever their next step is in the University of British Columbia. <laughs> I was going to say, how do you make sure that you continue to support that student? And that the work that she did is not something that people then say, oh, this is Phil's work, right? right. So it's sort, of a, it's sort of a launching question. When you have a right. student who's been so influential and you they launch, you want to continue to be supportive but you also don't want to step on the, the hem of their gown, right? Right, right. Um, I had an experience in graduate school where um, I came up with an idea, having sat on the curb with a friend over the holidays for a study that needed to be done. I shared it with a faculty person. We did the study and it was written up and published in a major journal, but the faculty person listed themselves first. And I remember thinking, that doesn't feel exactly right. So I've taken a position where every time I start a project, we decide who's the point guard. I'm a basketball guy. Who's the point guard and who's going to do what by what date? So if we're sitting around and someone says, you know, we really should look at dads of anxious youth because there's a lot of blaming of moms of being overprotective. What if dads are overprotective? You know, I'll say, OK, let's do that study. Who's going to be the point guard? And then we identify that person. All right, you'll be first author. The others will be in a particular order based on what we do. And I get it laid out ahead of time, um, in part because I think I don't want anyone having that disappointed feeling or the less than adequate recognition for your work feeling. That's an ouch. Um, and so we can we can steer clear of that. And I'm I'm thankful of Temple University because at my university, being first is important. But being last is also important because that's you're the senior person who arranged everything. And when I have graduate students, I'll let them be first on their uh, not let them. They are first on their projects um, and I'll be last. And so I don't feel like I'm lost in recognition that way. But if I write it up and if it's my idea or it was my grant and they worked on it, then I tend to be the first author. But I think the the passing on of the career development is something for me that's rewarding and I want them to be excited by science not leaving going I got ripped off by my advisor you know I, that that doesn't sit well um so I I, I kind of just make somebody the point guard right off and we run with it you know right. well thank you for explaining to me what a point guard is because I know <laughs> um, you know my one of my foibles I'm not into um, sports that include nets all that much. So, <laughs> so you talk about this up front and you give credit where credit's due and you allocate work and you encourage the student to sort of, I, in my lab, I say, who's the driver, right? Encourage the student whose idea it is to sort of get behind the wheel and to drive the project, meaning keeping after people who are doing different parts of things and providing support and encouragement and kind of being the safety net is what I'm hearing. Um, yeah, and I do sit on top of people to make sure they get it done. Uh, I don't think of myself as hounding them, but every week, you know, there'll be something I'll have to say to someone, where, where, where are you with that? Or what's the status of this? And um, in my earlier days, it was all in my head. Now I sometimes have to write it all down. Um, but I keep track of the various projects and where they are. Um, and, and I'm kind of candid with, with the students, um, saying things like, well, if you let it slide, then when you go to apply for this or that internship or job, you're going to put in press and, or in progress, and nobody will be impressed. But if you do the work now and you get it actually published, you might impress somebody. Mm -hmm. So it's your call but I need to tell you what you're leading up to. And usually that helps people get it done. 
yeah, what the contingencies are. Yeah, yeah. For me, it's really helpful to be accountable in a group to say, I'm going to go to the gym three days a week and to have a gym buddy that I then meet three days a week at the gym. I know that's kind of pathetic. I should go more often, but that's pretty I, good. That's good. <laughs> so I'm hearing that you build a culture of accountability on your team yeah. and that you um, try to point out kind of natural contingencies um, in terms of you know, let's do, if we do the work now, these are the M&Ms that will happen down the road. And if you don't do the work now, you know, and you want to do it later, that's your choice. That's totally fine. But there probably won't be much recognition for what you started and haven't moved over the goal line. Right. Right. Very, very true. Okay. Yeah. So how do you keep from becoming kind of my, my word is, you know, I'll send an email to a student that says, I don't want to be the nagging wench from hell, but <laughs> I heard from you on this project. How do you keep from kind of dropping into that role? Well, I appreciate you assuming I haven't fallen into that role. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I have actually. Um, I think I have the good fortune in part because we have a pretty active selection process. Of, of picking graduate students who come into our program who are motivated and who are accomplished in their own ways already. Um, if someone is um, dragging and, and not really interested, their peer group will give them feedback as well. Uh, so it's not just a, a solo performer in a sense, it's an orchestra. Uh, the whole program has a certain a pace to it and a focus to it. Uh, and I think that helps a lot. Um, yeah. 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 So you have a context around you that supports um, productivity and kind of moving at a certain pace. And yeah, how fortunate, how fortunate. What yeah. advice would you give to, um, I don't know, other academics about mentoring because it's clear that you you know you have passion for your research but you also have a passion for mentoring I mean for Pete's sake you keep this long list of everyone you've ever mentored and where they are now that <laughs> is, that's fabulous so what advice would you give to other folks other academics um, who are in mentoring uh, I, I want to uh, preface my attempt at an answer by saying I'm not religious. I think any any and all religions have a certain irrationality to them. And so I'm kind of just basically accepting some facts without the, the fanciful stuff. But most religions, you can extract some valuable advice. And the one that comes out of most religions is treat other people the way you want to be treated. That That's kind of the way I, I go about things. Um, and I think that communicates um, and speak truth to power. Right. right. You know, sometimes you get your hand slapped. Sometimes somebody doesn't like it. But if you're speaking the truth, you know, tell it like it is. Um, and, I, and I think those are strategies that help in mentoring. Well, and I'm hearing that you can speak the truth, but it's sitting on a bedrock of respect and um understanding and recognition so it's not like you're saying to a student who may be falling behind you know you're really falling behind which yeah. doesn't have yeah. that bedrock of respect and understanding um but to say you know you're really falling behind let's talk a little bit about what what's happening about what's going on yeah, yeah. i usually say it in, in terms of uh, we need to get this done. Who who else can we get involved to get it done? Or can you get it done? If you can't, who do we need to get involved? So any complaint should come with a potential solution. Yeah. You know, so if, if there's a problem, how are we going to solve it kind of thing? Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, I'm going to switch gears. I'm going to ask you to get personal for a minute. And I don't mean like that kind of personal. But... <laughs> 
Right now in a lot of training environments, there's a whole lot of discussion about so-called work-life balance and helping students to sort of, I don't know, sometimes I hear it as like putting your work in one box and your life in another box. And I've watched you, Phil, I've watched you at ABCT and um, I know that your family is incredibly important to you. And, you know, your wife typically goes to that convention with you and you're often bragging on some, some part of your family. And we've had, um, we've had raffles for your son's movie for Pete's sake, right? I mean, so you're incredibly proud of your family, which I love that about you. Um, I also know you're really into sports that include nets, but we're not going to talk about that right now because no one really wants to hear about tennis and basketball, but maybe they do. But how do you, how do you, you have this incredible um, record of productivity and this incredible love and centering for your family. How have you balanced your family life with this high level of professional activities? And so that's what I mean about something that's a little more personal. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't wanna wax into quick labels, but functional OCD, <laughs> you know, um, I don't obsess over things, but if I start something, I want to finish it. Um, and I'm really organized. So I keep things kind of in flow. Um, finish what you start, be organized. And I, and I tend not to sit on things that are done. You know, if I, if I finish the study and we've analyzed it, we wrote it up, I'm not going to sit on it for two months. I'll sit on it one day, I'll read it the next day, and I'll say, it's 95, 98% there. I could sit on it for two more months and maybe get one more percent. But you know what? It's the time to submit it. Let's find out if the big picture of what we did and what we found and how we interpreted it is reportable. Um, so I tend not to sit on things. I tend to have a, a productive flow going rather than than sitting on things. I, I, I have a ton of energy. I mean, that's just, um, I jokingly uh, think of myself as productive in part because I have a lot of energy, uh, but I don't have as much energy as some other people. I know people who, you know, swim more laps than I did, so to speak. Um, but I think having energy makes a difference. Um, and I, I don't tend to waste time. Um, I mean, We've been talking. I haven't been doing my email at the same time. I haven't been answering texts, texts at the same time because we're doing something important. But if I were in a meeting, uh, a department meeting, and I've heard at the executive committee, I've heard the report. Now I'm in the department meeting and they're giving the report again. I might be doing some email. Um, so I do have that effective overlap or time-driven efficiency kind of thing going. Um, that, I think that's more just uh, the fortune of my upbringing and genes and environment and those kinds of things. Yeah, the energy yeah. helps. Yeah, for sure. And I love the fact, like I sent you an email kind of, I don't remember where in the Thanksgiving weekend I sent it. And you didn't look at it until you got back to Philadelphia. <laughs> um, and I loved that. I was like, okay, Phil's going to respond in the next, you know, five minutes. And you didn't respond until you got back from visiting family. Um, so do you kind of put little barriers around, no, this is time where I'm going to spend with my family and I'm not necessarily going to be trying to, to multitask or was that just that happened? I think the honest answer is on retrospect, I probably do some of that, but it isn't a conscious or planned approach. I think it's a good explanation looking back, but at the time, I don't think I was doing it on purpose. Okay. You know, 
Um, you, but I did. You... I do things like if it's Thanksgiving weekend, I'll get to it Monday. Um, and I probably sent you a picture of my granddaughter. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I don't think I was saying this is family, this is work, keep them separate. I think it just kind of made sense to do it that way. Um, and someone once said, you can never be a king in your own castle kind of thing. And so I've never tried to be a psychologist at home. I'm just a dad, you know. Uh, I've never tried to be a academic in circles that are social or athletic. Um, so maybe I do put it in boxes, but that wasn't on purpose or intentional. Yeah, so I'm here and it's not really boxes. It's not like you're scheduling out, okay, it's family time, I can't be doing this, but oh, yeah, no. you are where you are and you focus on what's important, what your priorities are. So if you're visiting family, they're your priority, not answering the email that I sent to you at five o'clock in the morning, probably, right? right. right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think that when I hear some of the discussion about work-life balance, um, many of us in academics, the balance isn't so much um, work life. The balance is how do I integrate work and life in a way that allows me to use my energy, work at times that my head works best, right? Be present for family when I'm with family understand what my priorities are, right? So I'm hearing that you're actually an amazing role model for that. Um, Thank you. Yeah, really pretty amazing role model. Um, here's a question, kind of going back to um, the question about mentoring. Um, have you noticed any changes over time in graduate students as a group? in terms of things like their ambition, their motivation, expectations, anxiety, those kinds of things. And so how has that impacted your approach to mentoring? Um, I have noticed differences. Um, I don't think it's necessarily good or bad, but I have noticed differences. The, the obvious one is um, nine out of 10 of our incoming class are probably female by birth. Um, we have a larger number of people coming with two years post baccalaureate work at somebody's lab. You know, it used to be right out of grad, out of undergraduate school, you'd be accepted into graduate school. Now there's this two year they went out and did something to build their vita or whatever. It's much more competitive. There's, I think, a little bit more interest in psychology that's self interest, if you will. There's a little bit more personal touch that I pick up on some of our applicants. Not all, but some. People who want to study eating disorders have had issues, or people who want to study depression have a family member who is depressed. A little bit more of that these days um, than in the past. Or maybe in the past, I just didn't notice it. I, I don't know. Um, and we are conscientious with regard to DEI. Um, uh, I, I think the diversity is a, a current press and a good one. Um, that we're working hard on uh, to try and have people with scientific mental health focus who come from different backgrounds. Um, there was a time, and I'll use ABPP as an example, American Board of Professional Psychology. If you want to be board certified, that's the board. And there was a time when that was all white men, you know? Uh, and I think there's a picture of Clark University's Department of Psychology from 100 years ago, and it was all white men with beards. <laughs> um, things have changed and we have to we have to recognize that there's value in that and we need people to be experts from a variety of perspectives in order to not only inform science but to inform mental health services. Um, so that's a shift I've seen in graduate students. Um, I, and this is silly, but I used to be able to pronounce everyone's name the first time. And now it's much tougher. Good. I have to practice. <laughs> Excellent. Here's another really good question that came in. Um, it's been widely reported that the United States is experiencing rising levels of anxiety. Um, as an anxiety expert, especially for 
kids. Do you have any thoughts about how we might address that and how we can, you know, maybe buffer kids or, or shore kids up um, if the tide is rising, right? Yeah. So I think whoever asked the question is correct. There is an increase in the frequency of anxiety being reported as a problem. There's an increase in the percentage of kids who qualify for disorder. Um, and some of it might be accurate. If, if you've lived through three years of COVID or two and a half or whatever, and you were perhaps even having lived through an airplane flying into a building and terrorism and, and school shootings and a variety of things, it's legitimate to have a higher sensitivity to potentially fearful situations. What I think is lacking and the more solution-oriented answer is we could spend more time normalizing anxiety in kids, talking about how you think about the possibility of something happening, but you also think about the probability of it happening. And you wanna be prepared if it's likely, but you don't have to be over-prepared if it's unlikely. So there might be a sandstorm that when the sand blows, it gets in your eyes and you can't see, but if you don't live in a desert, you don't need to prepare for the sandstorm. And so separating out possible and probable is something we could teach kids younger. Separating out that being anxious is normal, but you just don't want to get it to its interfering level. You want to use it as a signal, but not let it become interfering. So I would say early intervention, some prevention, and some respect for the fact that negative emotions are okay and normal. A lot of the old fashioned thinking is, you know, sadness or anxiety or anger, these are negative emotions and they're bad. No, sometimes they're totally legit and, and it's okay to experience them and use them as they're intended. If you're anxious, it means there's something you think might happen that you don't want to happen. You're anticipating a catastrophe. Let's evaluate whether it's gonna happen or not and adjust. And so I think we could do some um, better work in schools and certainly better work with parents on how to manage and not, not teach kids that it'll, it'll not happen, but teach them how to manage anxiety when it does happen. For sure. For sure. I'm sure you probably integrated some of that when you were raising kids. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't quite hear that, Gail. So I'm sure you probably integrated some of that wisdom when you were in your kids because you know they're they were sort of like your your test lab for some of these <laughs> sure. yeah neither one is particularly anxious <laughs> <laughs> my uh, my one son was a musician and played in a rock band for about 10 or 12 years on the road and i remember um he was performing at the keswick theater and there were about three thousand people in the audience and it was him and his guitar up there and i thought He's not anxious. Which is which is quite a, um, makes quite a strong testimony about like your parenting, you and your wife's parenting, that you have been able to raise kids that can walk out on a stage with that many people in front of them who are all looking at them and waiting to see what they do and they don't choke, right? Yeah. That's, yeah, that's pretty amazing. You've been really forthcoming about lots of different parts of your professional career and your impact and impact for you has so many different facets. Um, what haven't I asked you that's important when we th think about your impact? Um. So I, when we when we were doing treatment studies, we created therapist manuals. And I remember a lot of people had knee jerk negative reactions to a manual. You can't do a therapy manual, but it wasn't like a required step by step say these words. It was a general helpful process. You know, teach these skills and then do exposure and practice. You know, if a kid's afraid of needles. You talk about what they do. You talk about how you might feel. Uh, and I don't know if you can see this. This is a pen. Looks like a needle, but it's really a pen. And you can play with it. You can poke it in your skin. You know, and 
you get experience that allows you to think differently. But the manuals were perceived negatively. And so the, the thing I would bring up that wasn't asked that I think is important is flexibility within fidelity. Fidelity to a treatment that says, educate about A, B, C, and D, have homework, have practice, do exposure, and then allow them to celebrate success. That's essential. But within that, flexibility. The rewards can be different for different kids. The exposures are different for different kids. How they learn about their emotions can be different for different kids. And one kid might play a game of connect four while you're talking about emotions. Another kid might sit there and not play a game. But you're still getting across learning about emotion. So I think flexibility within treatment fidelity um, is a hot topic for me. And I think one that while we didn't talk about it, I'm glad you brought up the opportunity to talk about it. Yeah, and when that first article came out, um, that was quite a while ago. For me as an educator, that was an incredibly important article because many times students think that they have to say exactly what's in the manual. You know, pick your right hand up, pick up the hand up, hand it to the client. <laughs> and the idea that there's like a central components of treatment, but that's done in the context of a working relationship um, between you and your client is so essential. And, you know, you know, as well as I, that we can say things when we're working with students, but if you give them an article to read, somehow it becomes a little bit more legitimate. So I want to thank you for that original article because I have used that oh, to help students sure. understand that you know treatment manuals are not just intrinsically evil things, that they are useful guide, they're useful structure. Um, and then within that, you need to make sure the treatment is fitting to the person that you're working with. Yeah, yeah. And as we're chatting, I, I think back, um, there was a time when I was helping out with one of the APA journals and um, it was a journal at the time of book reviews. And so I would get books and send them to people to review. And I would get a few that I wouldn't send out. And one was labeled a manual. Uh, I didn't bother to send it out because it was not very good. It was just an outline. There was no conversation. There was no opportunity for flexibility. It was like a, a mechanical outline something you might get when you buy a new car and you flip through the, the inner workings of the engine or something. And I, it, it struck me as not helpful. Um, and so my reaction to that, I think, has influenced how I produce manuals. We'll, we'll have a little pop-up on a page that says flex. And what it means if you go to the asterisk is you can do this differently. Lots of ways. Here are a couple of suggestions, but don't miss out the basic point, you know? Yeah, yeah, I love that. I am mindful that we are rounding the bend on the what time set aside. Oh, wow, wow, 20, okay. Yeah, and, and clearly time flies when you're having a great conversation with an amazing award winner. I want to thank you, Phil, for making time to speak with all of us and for being so, so you, right? For being so, such a human. You know, you've talked a lot about um, not just your research work, but also who you are with your trainees, how you um, have sort of navigated your life in terms of having a rich family life while having a very active professional life. It's an honor to learn more about you oh, and you. to celebrate your commitment and your impact on the field of psychology. I want to congratulate you again on your very well-deserved gold medal award. Thank you, Gail. And, you know, you're a high flyer. So I'm, I'm thrilled that you're the person who gets to uh, have a conversation. I enjoyed having the conversation. And with the exception of not talking about sports with Nets, you did a really good job. <laughs> yeah, because I know nothing about sports. <laughs> so, you know, what can I say? Um, I also want to thank the attendees for joining us today. Um, I think that time with Phil Kendall is 
is precious time. Bill's gone an entire hour without doing something else. <laughs> He's been talking to us, which I you know, told you is precious time. Okay. Um, APF will be offering fireside chats monthly. Uh, we have them scheduled through February of 2023. And details on registering for upcoming webinars will be included in the follow-up when recordings are available. So if you want to go back and listen to this discussion that Phil and I have had, please do. I think you'll probably find that Phil's uh, wisdom is fairly deep, even though he can be um, really succinct in sharing it with us. Um, we also invite you to share this recording and information about our fireside chats with anyone you think would be interested in joining us. Um, all of us at APF wish you and your loved ones safety and health as we continue into the final portion of this year. And we hope that you have wonderful, warm time to celebrate the end of the year and various holidays with your family members. Bill, thank you again for sharing yourself with us today. This is so, so deeply appreciated. Thank you, Gail. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.